Caleb Nygaard with us. So Caleb currently is a senior research associate at the uh, Yale Program on Financial Stability. And we're gonna have him talk a little bit about what that is because it, sure. it's a really exciting program. And sure. before that, his connection back to the Fed, I mean, this is where the love of the Fed starts, right? You've got to, you get inside the family and you never really leave. So he was a statistical analyst at the Chicago Fed. And in addition to the many kinds of work that he does, uh, Caleb also has a podcast that I would highly recommend. It's called The Reserve. And we'll talk a little bit about that too, because I know there's, Caleb, you're trying to do some really great stuff with that project. Sure. And so definitely want to amplify that. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the nominations, could you tell us just a little bit more about your your journey into the interest and, and not just the Fed, like where you're, yeah. you know, the path you're, you've been on and where you're headed. And, and maybe this is a good time to talk about some of these projects, like the, the reserve and other things. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, got into the, I, I was just so excited to, to be able to be at the central bank when I got my first job out of college. I went to a, a small college in, in Idaho, Brigham Young University in Idaho, and uh, I was just so excited to land my first job at the Chicago Fed. Um, you know, I had studied it in school and, and was excited to, to be at the place. Um, and it was good and it was interesting work um, for those that, that know even a little bit about the, about the Fed. The reserve banks are where most of the operations end up happening. Uh, and so I was on an operational team and really just inside the walls. And that was really great. But even while I was there, I knew that there was there was more. I, I wanted more of the institution. I wanted more of the history. I wanted more of the current events and the policy. Uh, and so began dabbling in, uh, in, in podcasts and things like that. I got so into the uh, like big picture about the Fed and the, the history and how that impacts the decisions that the Fed's making today that I actually decided to, to, to leave uh, to try and find something where I could just dive full into that. And so I found uh, there, I had been given some advice in, in actually in high school as I was going into college uh, that I then applied again at this kind of point in my career, which was uh, somebody had said, uh, take professors, not classes, meaning that find people, basically find people that are doing, not only doing interesting work, but are doing it in a way that you connect with, um, even if it's maybe not exactly where uh, the direction you want to go. I happen to have uh, find Professor Andrew Metric at, uh, at the Yale School of Management, uh, who was working on this thing called the Yale Program on Financial Stability, uh, which is kind of an umbrella project that captures a couple of different, uh, different things that, uh, that we're working on here. But I'll talk about the big one just very briefly, which is, is kind of the most exciting. And it's called the New Badget Project. And that name will sound very familiar um, from the, the, the kind of the writer of the Bible of central banking, uh, which we have different thoughts and on. And when was that written? So that was so that was a book called Lombard Street. Uh, Walter Badgett of The Economist magazine, he's kind of the, the 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 second editor of The Economist magazine, wrote this book in 1873 uh, about the Bank of England. Uh, and there are a few lines in there that have been pulled up, pulled out, and and smashed together into kind of this golden rule of, of, of central banking, this, this dictum, which is the only time I ever hear that you word used. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but basically, it's like, what do you do in a financial crisis is kind of the idea. Um, the, the impetus for the new budget project was kind of we need an, an updated, you know, it's the budget rule is literally like one sentence and, and policymakers uh, need more meat to it. And so basically what we're doing, the mission of the New Badget Project is to, is to document and to, to summarize and to catalog every intervention by a central bank or fiscal authority during a financial crisis of the last, I think it started with the last hundred years. Then we brought on a historian from, 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 uh, from Harvard, Paul Schmelzing, and we're back like 700 years now. So we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna be a big thing. And the idea is that if you wanna do, if a policymaker, and the target audience is policymakers. It's neither academics nor necessarily the broader public, although both are going to interact with it. 
Uh, but the idea is just that, you know, if you want to, if you're in a, a type of crisis, you, know, you got a bunch of bad loans in the banking system. You can go to this online interactive new budget uh, platform that will have, you'll be able to pull up as much or as little detail as you want about every time a country has had to face that kind of crisis. And so it's, uh, it's a cool project, uh, still a couple of years away from fully launching, but, uh, uh, but it's, been a, it's been a great opportunity. And it's taken me a little bit away from the operational day-to-day uh, central banking and into a little bit more of the the policy and the financial crisis aspects of central banking. Yeah, no, and I think especially when you're thinking around financial crises, so this lender of last resort, right? We talk yeah. a lot about monetary policy now and interest rates go up, they go down. But the reason that we have central banks is in a moment of crisis, they are the ones that are the ones who will lend this lender of last resort. And we have seen uh, twice in recent memory, the Federal Reserve stepping in big time as a lender of last resort. And, And I do, I absolutely affirm the project where you're documenting it because it's exactly in a financial crisis, things move so fast that afterwards it is just a blur. So, um, I started the Federal Reserve in the summer of 2007. Uh, my first year on the staff forecast was a birth by fire. Oh my gosh. I, at some point found early on, the New York Fed had a timeline. And the top of the timeline were Federal Reserve actions. And the bottom were things happening in the world, right? Like that were related to it. And I had at some like after a few years, like this thing was stretching around the side of my office. Like I put it up on the wall and I had a little push pin for when I started <laughs> and just watching this. But it was it was really amazing. And yeah. I think there there's so much that happens in a crisis. And honestly, like when you all put that together for this one, yeah, it will just be, you know, I mean, like a massive amount, like what the Fed did yeah. in this crisis is just beyond. Um, I mean, good. Like, I'm not saying they overdid it, but it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a massive effort. So that sounds awesome. Uh, it, are you like, where are you all at at the project? Is this something we can Google and find the start of it? Or is it still? Yeah, space? very, very soon. So we, we, we write these in-depth case, case studies between 15 and 40 pages on every single intervention. And then those case studies, they get broken up into, uh, you know, in, we, we digitize, you know, like we, we break them up all into little sections so that you can compare across countries or across crises or across a uh, 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 specific type. And that's getting all put into an online platform. So in fact, we just went through uh, the first uh, wave of uploading it to the platform. And I expect that to be made public uh, this summer. So like you'll have, and it'll just be a certain type. So like, for example, literally just this week, I was, I was working on uploading to the platform some of our work that we've done on uh, broad-based capital injections. Mm-hmm. And so that type of intervention will be there on the platform it, this summer. And it'll be open. It's, it is open to the public. I mean, anybody can, can access it. Uh, and then we're a couple of years. I mean, I, I'd say like maybe 24, 20, 25 is when the, like the, you know, we'll hit that critical mass of maybe, you know, 70 percent of all the cases that could be written will be on the platform as well so we're a couple of years away from getting to that that stage but uh but the first inklings will be in just a couple months away wow oh that's really exciting i'll I'll look forward to it and i do like it's so important to set the policies that are and, and the economics discussions around the policies in the historical context yeah like i um before Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, when he was Fed chair, did one of his first first public speaking events. Like, it's really a pretty yeah. new thing for a Fed chair to go out in public and want people to understand them. <laughs> yeah. wasn't, it wasn't into being understood. Um, and he was going to do like a PBS town hall or something like that. So um, the public affairs at the board, being the way they are, organized a um, practice. Town oh my gosh. So we it. could apply to go to it. It was limited and you got a little golden ticket or something oh like that. Um, anyway, so I applied and yes. I got to go to the town hall. And me being the way I am, I asked a question. Yes. I thought, you know what? I have had to answer a whole bunch of his questions and pop up in the boardroom. 
ask a question. I don't think he was surprised. Um, but what I asked him is Ben Bernanke, and this his appointment was just a brilliant stroke of luck because he is one of the economists who is the leading expert, one of the leading experts on the Great Depression and what the Federal Reserve did in the Depression. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, you're a scholar of the Great Depression. How did that affect you leading the Fed now? Yeah. And he said, he's like, well, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Yeah. So it's not like he, you know, when the world was falling apart in 2008, it's not like he yeah. had a playbook in his head but he knew the urgency of what the Fed needed to do, and he knew some of the mistakes that yeah. they had made during the Great Depression. So I thought it was a lovely answer. Um, I don't think he got that question in the town hall, <laughs> um, but, but no, so I think, and that's an example of someone who's led the Federal Reserve in recent history and is deeply steeped in yeah. its history. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's is, and just as important as the and that kind of leads to a really important part that I, these types of, of playbooks and these types of, of historical material, they, you got to like inject it into the system, even in peace times, to exactly your point, like the Fed lucked out in having him there because he had spent so much of the non-financial crisis time thinking. And, and like you said, there's nothing, there's no one-to-one. -one. Despite the Fed pulling out in 2020, a ton of the stuff they'd done in 2008, it was also still an incredibly different situation and they had to do new stuff and do the old stuff differently. But having that knowledge, yeah, absolutely. Well, and we'll come back to history because there are some blind spots in the Fed's yeah. history. And I do think we're going to see some of that addressed soon. So I hope. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit. Uh, the reason I had you on today is I wanted to make sure I had a chance to hear what you thought of Biden's appointees to the Federal Reserve. So as uh, we're, he's, he's done his full five now, right? So earlier we had uh, the appointments for chair, so for Jay Powell to have a second term, uh, Leo Brainer to be the vice chair. Both of them had their confirmation hearings before Senate banking this week, and they totally rocked it, like both yep. of them. And it was absolutely clear from the questions on both sides of the aisle, they're getting confirmed. Yeah. Right? Like with yep. both, they're going to have a lot of votes. Um, yeah. Anyways, and it was lovely. And I would, um, okay, for those who are really into the Fed, the confirmation yes. hearings were really great to listen to. Neither of them were asked a lot about what they would do as a fit. I mean, they were asked about it. Um, their qualifications were in no way questioned. I mean, absolutely both of them are top notch. They got a lot of questions on what's happening in the economy. Yeah. Why is it happening? Uh, yeah. A big role of the Federal Reserve, and frankly, I think it's its most important tool right now is its communication policy. And yeah. it's not just about communicating what the Fed is going to do it's communicating what the world is going to do, like how things are going to roll out because they are seen as something of a independent arbiter. Um, yeah. And and they are, you know, but they're not, yeah. per, like they're kind of treated a little bit like an oracle and they do not have, there is no oracle of Delphi inside of the, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm sure we looked for it, but it is not there. So it was just really interesting to hear their views and, they're good communicators. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'll and I'll say about just the nominations real quick before we get into the new ones. You know that that question Powell was explicitly asked, like, are you are or to confirm you are the economic policymaker for the government? And and he, it made him uncomfortable. Obviously, yeah. it, it made him a little bit uncomfortable. But that you're that is such a good point to pull out that that is how they are viewed and that independence and that um, uh, you know that aspect of the Fed is really is really crucial and it has changed in time and the Fed could lose it or they could make it stronger. It's that's another thing. It's nothing is is guaranteed. Yeah, no, that's true. And Jay speaks with a lot of humility and humanity. And yeah, those he's the real deal. Like yeah. You can't you can't make that stuff up. As one can see with a lot of my peers, like we're not uh, this is not part of the macro PhD training program, um, which that's fine. We're, that's not sure. what we're selected for. But he sure. he has that um, 
And frankly, I think it's a good thing he doesn't have a PhD in macro, but like that's yeah. not a popular opinion and it's not important, um, but he's very yeah. good at it. And as is Leo, they're, they've been an excellent team when she was a governor. I mean, frankly, she was doing the workload of a vice chair. Yeah, years. Sure. That's usually how you get a promotion. You're already working sure. above sure. Uh, your job grade. Um, yeah. And then, and then what we got last night in kind of a surprise, we're all watching TV, hanging out, Literally. the news mm -hmm. drops, news that mm -hmm. has been promised to us since early December. Yeah. Checks calendar. It is not. Um, so anyways, but we, we had the appointment. So I think the big one people were waiting to hear about is there is a vice chair of supervision which is a yeah. relatively new position. Um, I think uh, Randy Quarles was the first one to hold it, right? Yeah, he was the first one yeah. to be confirmed into that spot. Tarullo, yeah. unofficial. Yeah, like kind of an unofficial. Um, yeah, yeah. But definitely played the role, but didn't have the title. Right. So the um, nomination for the vice chair of supervision is Sarah Bloom Raskin. Uh, I worked with Sarah when she oh, was cool. at the Fed because she was a governor um, during the uh, Obama administration. She also served, after she finished her tenure at the board, she was the um, deputy secretary at Treasury. I think that's right. Um, yeah. And has a law degree. So there's not, there's yep. actually, they're going to be when they all get confirmed, and they're all going to get confirmed, uh, there yeah. will be three non-economists on the yeah. board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we need lots of different kinds of diversity. And frankly, you know, the regulatory work that the Fed does that often doesn't get discussed in the same way as the monetary policy, it's a really powerful tool. And I yeah. think comparatively, even for things like maximum employment, it has it might have more bite than some of the interest rate policies. I Absolutely. mean, it's very different and they do have, you know, fair lending and community development. Um, but in general, like the financial system is really important for people, families, Absolutely. small businesses, right? So, yeah. um, so that's a big job and Sarah has been nominated to hold it. She will probably be the toughest of the confirmation hearings, but I still think she will go through, she's highly capable, a very smart woman and has the technical skills to do that. All of the appointees or all of the nominations do. And that's really important. Like the Fed is not a cakewalk. Yeah, right? like totally. it's a it's a pretty intense um, job. And then the other two appointments are for the open governor seeds. And uh, one is um, Lisa Cook. So she is a uh, Black woman professor of economics at Michigan State. Uh, this, uh, sadly, in the economics profession, it is a very rare combination. She's a full professor. Uh, Lisa yeah, is awesome. Yeah. She is a good friend. So, I mean, I was really jumping up and down last night. Um, and then the final appointment, I'm sorry, the final nomination. See, I'm already ready for them to have yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they're not appointed. Um, okay, um, the final one is Philip. Jefferson. So he is, um, I guess he was a longtime professor at Swarthmore. I think mm -hmm. that's right. And he's now a dean. Where is he a dean at? Do you remember? In North Carolina. Um, I can't remember the name of the school. Yeah. Is it Davidson? That sounds right. Yeah. In any case, so I have never met uh, Philip. He, he's also an economist, a black man, also. Uh, so we'll, I, we will have two. Um, black economists on the board of governors and so that's historic and there's never been a black woman well, yes. we're going to talk more about history so i'll, I'll, yeah, I'll turn it yeah. over to you for that part um yeah. and, and and so i don't know him personally but i have uh, talked to a lot of people who've been his students oh and cool they just absolutely rave about you know not just his teaching but his mentorship so again we need like every single person on the board to bring a, like the humanity yeah. and they do. So this yeah. is good. This is good for all of us. Okay. Yeah. So, and fingers crossed, they're going to get their hearing soon. I, I, I really hope Biden hasn't like made this more difficult, but whatever yeah. they're announced, the official announcement was out this morning. 
Yep. Yay, this is great. Okay, so now we set the stage with what just happened. Sure. Tell us what this means in yeah. the history of the Fed, because we'll hear a lot of people say this is historic, but you can tell yeah. us exactly what that means. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we can work uh, from from recent past to maybe to, to deeper past. Uh, and I think we can start where where you started as well, which is with the, the vice chair for supervision. Um, there is just the nature of this position, you know, created by Dodd-Frank and but not Dan Trulo didn't get the, the formal nod to fill that position. Um, Quarles came in as the first vice chair for supervision. He did some big things in, in a couple of years, in the, in the years that he, that he was there. Um, and then he left, uh, right? He, 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 his position as the leadership ended and the Fed inside the walls did some, did some things. They, they decided to the committee that the internal committee that the, that the vice chair for supervision had led, uh, they decided to leave it as leave the chair's seat empty of that committee. And so there are a lot of, of precedent setting uh, things that are still to be determined for this job. There's still the Fed and I think the public and Congress, they're still trying to figure out what exactly is this, uh, what is this job and what are the norms around this job. Uh, and so there are, there's one big thing that I'm going to be looking for, and that is the, the degree of, of deference that the chair, which is Powell right now, gives to the vice chair of supervision. Um, looks like it'll be Raskin. Now, uh, that's going to be really important, and it's going to be important on publicly and in things like votes, uh, but I think for those paying close attention to things like the minutes and to things uh, like speeches, uh, we're going to get even more of a peek into what that relationship is, um, and this will set up a time when a the chair is was first appointed. Powell's got a cool history, a cool bipartisan history. Obama as a governor, chair as from Trump, and then chair again from Biden. Um, then someone from uh, from Brainerd as or excuse me, uh, uh, Raskin in that position. So there is some, in, there might be some inherent or potential friction between. Uh, between those those two leadership positions, and so going forward, I'm excited to to be watching closely to see how they handle it in the big picture stuff as well as in the more subtle uh, subtle areas. Because this this position, like I said, it's it's a baby position. It's brand new. It's still it's still getting its you know maybe maybe it's not a baby. Maybe it's a toddler. It's still learning how to walk. It's still learning to figure out who it is. And toddlers um, can be kind of fussy. <laughs> so yeah, no, I uh, think. Um, and, and this came up some in Powell's hearing because I think yeah, in, yeah. in some ways, I mean, Randy Quarles was the first person to hold this title. Um, right. So, you know, that's, you're just getting going. His public presence, in my opinion, was fairly muted. And so I think what people, like Senator Elizabeth Warren is one prominent example. I think when there were regulatory changes, pointed the responsibility to Jay Powell, right, for yeah. those changes, and she disagreed with some of those changes, right, right. Um, now, obviously, the buck stops with the chair, right, so he does have a responsibility, I just think from the outside, like, I, I have seen him, like, be deaf, I mean, he's, like, works well with all of his colleagues, but when there's, like when a colleague has more expertise in an area, he's very much deferential and looks to them for, well, what's your advice? Right? Yeah. Like he's not, um, not all chairs have been like this. Yes. Um, like he's not Correct. there as some kind of a dictator of policy, but the to really underscore that, I mean, not everyone gets the vantage point that I got to have as a Fed staffer for yeah. a decade. So it's important that there is a public like the people can point to and listen to Sarah talk about it and talk through. And, and then it's clear like where the expertise, where the policy discussion is being driven from. The vice chair plays a lot of that role with monetary policy 
Um, yeah. That's why I was really pro Leo for vice chair, because there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done behind monetary policy. And frankly, the chair on monetary policy spends a lot of time hurting the angry cats of the Federal Open Market Committee. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> that's a, sure. a full time job. And I don't think Jay has a lot of quiet thinking time. Yeah. Um, no. You know, they're all very busy, but the vice chair is more of a thought leader on monetary sure. policy, which is exactly what Rich Clarida the role he yeah. played. So I think we've got people in good positions, but you're right. The vice chair of supervision has a more complicated task and people on the outside are watching carefully and absolutely financial markets affect, like this is important. Um, I think one thing that doesn't get discussed, like, I think regulatory policy is really interesting. It wasn't until like right at the end of my time at the Fed when I worked sure. in consumer and community affairs that I was exposed to it. Um, supervision and regulation is the biggest division at the board. Like there, And you know, in the reserve yeah, banks, yeah. there are a lot of the brokers oh, on the ground. So I mean, really yeah. the big chunk of yeah. federal reserve system uh, employees are regulatory, right? Absolutely. Uh, but the Fed doesn't go it alone. There yeah. are, they work right. closely on a lot of regulations with banks, um, with the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, so the FDIC, uh, both of which have been in the news some. Um, they're more yeah. connected back to the yeah. administration and the federal government, but it's really those three that work together. Again, I think my understanding with a lot of the new policies, the Fed has looked to as kind of the thought leader yeah. on it. I mean, all three implement and all three in normal times, not always, but all three work together collaboratively um, yeah absolutely. but yeah so that's going to be exciting to watch i agree yep. okay so yeah. Seth, give us some more con like what else are you yeah. looking for in the setting in the context of history for the fed yeah so i so let's go so let's go into the the diversity i've got a whole uh, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it we already talked about there will be four four if all confirmed there will be four economists three uh three lawyers although each of the lawyers have very different mm -hmm. backgrounds as well as to what kind of areas within uh, within the law their their careers have taken them. Um, and I want to make sure we talk about geography because that's mm -hmm. that that is something that comes up with governors as well. Uh, but let's start uh, yeah. with yeah. Go ahead. Four women and three men. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yeah, I don't exactly. think women have ever been a majority. So they have been in, so they've been in the majority once, once. in in 2000 um, I think 11 when uh, because there were two vacancies it was after oh, Walsh okay. Walsh left so it was three yeah. women and two and and okay. Bernanke so this is the first time we had four women but it's the first time we've okay. had four women. So, so, yes <laughs> so, I've got yes yeah, so I got a cool list here that you right, know, I've okay. been going back through the data. So, so, so there's a quote. Cool, so yes, we've talked about Lisa Cook, first black woman, 10809 year institution. That's far too late, but we're so excited that we're here with that. Um, there are, uh, uh, so the total number of women that have served on the board goes from 10 to 11. Uh, now Biden had, you know, he, he chose uh, three women oh, of those five, but here. two, yeah. <laughs> two of them were, were repeats. So yep. you go to 13, but two of them are double yep. counts, yep. Uh, which is fine there. And, and just like to put it out there in the open, that is often how, um, the first, some of the first steps in, in diversity, it's not just at the Fed, but in, in almost all areas, the people that, uh, the first kind of break the glass are either way qualified, like, beyond belief qualified um or they are are associated with somebody you know in the senate it's you know many of the state's first women senators are like spouses of of past senators. so so it's super important to break those boundaries but also you know that's yeah. the, the first you know to call out kind of reality as we see it and so yeah. we still well, have a long Yellen way to go was the trifecta like she's yeah. the only one to be the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, yes. the Fed chair, and she was the first woman Fed chair, and now she's the Secretary of the Treasury. Yeah, right? it's so, so cool. And she's the first woman Secretary of the Treasury. Correct. Right? Yeah. So I mean, one, and yeah. and that one she got by being like way above the bar, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, yeah, I this is not lost on me. I have no. Yeah, it's just, it's just a, yeah. I think it's just worth pointing out, and hopefully, as it goes on, it it 
you know, the idea in diversity and all of this stuff is that hopefully eventually it won't be except it won't be the headline, right? That I think it should be the headline today, but we want to get to a point where eventually it won't be. So anyway, so that's just like, yep, just happened. So, okay. No, that's, and I appreciate like there's diversity on all dimensions. And, you know, we talked about backgrounds, both intellectual backgrounds, yeah. work backgrounds, yeah. um, race, gender, and geography is one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it is built in yeah. to the foundation wow. of the Fed. Actually, why yeah. don't you tell us about that? Because I don't think like everyone, like how the reserve banks fit with the, the board of governors and, you know, some of the yeah, facts okay. about the two. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So, so yeah. Okay. So let's, so we can spend some time on the geography here. So I guess kind of two ways, I guess, big, big picture, just fed structure in general, you know, you can, uh, the, the, the cliff notes version is that there was just this big debate when deciding, deciding whether, how to structure the new central bank. After panic of 1907, they decided we do need a central bank. Do we have one big one, like many of the European central banks, and they had those advocates. And then there were people that said, now our country's really different. We're really big, Geogra you know, geographically, we're really spread out. Uh, the, the compromise basically was that there would be an office in DC and then there would be 12. There, the Congress said there could be between eight and 12. Uh, the committee that was assigned to chose said that there would be 12. So they drew this, gra this, this chart, this map of the country and they drew 12 circles, 12 districts. Um, over the first 20 years, it was like organizational, it was pure chaos. As far as like, there was, there was just fights between the Washington and the brand and the reserve bank districts. And there were, there was this just this massive amount of confusion, governance confusion, because the law was so vague. Um, it slowly, you know, fixed itself in some areas. It started to move naturally towards some consolidation. Big change in the 30s over a couple of acts, big one in 1935, uh, that really kind of brought it to where mostly we are today. And that is that the, the policy and monetary policy uh, so not the supervision stuff that still stays with the governors in Washington, just those seven, but the monetary, the interest rate stuff that happens um, with 19, all 12 of the reserve banks and all seven governors when it at capacity, they get together and uh, five of the reserve banks on a rotating basis uh, that was changed in the 40s, but hasn't changed since the 40s. Um, uh, they get to vote and they rotate every year. So you get this like geographic diversity on that scale. Now for relevant for today's purposes, and I, I am working on something that I'm going to, that I'm going to publish on Twitter. I do these ungodly long threads. I'm going to do <laughs> one on geography. It. They're good. Yeah, and they're fun. They're fun. They're fun to put together. I, 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 uh, I, I break Twitter frequently and the, there are certain limits on, on thread length and stuff that I just push right through. Uh, so I, I, so I've got some stuff coming out on this, but, but there is something specifically in the law about the governors in that it says that the governors, um, it, it says that the governors shall, you know, not more than one governor shall be selected from any one federal reserve district. So legally the, the, the governors are supposed to come from different districts. So if you've got seven they're supposed to come from different different districts in uh, different Federal Reserve districts. Is that going to be true this time? So, 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 so this is what this, this, this little project that, I, that I'm working on. The, the definition of, of, of from <laughs> is left to basically two, two groups of people. You get the White House who gets to decide. And when they submit their nominations, they actually say, um, and this is how it is for all nominations, uh, they're introduced as coming from a place. And so today, um, uh, this morning, actually, it wasn't last night. Last night, the news broke. But yeah, this morning was the, was the official. Yeah. The, the, this, Biden submitted in this morning. So that was one of the first things I checked this morning. And Raskin is introduced as coming from Maryland. She says, you know, Sarah Bloom Raskin yeah. of Maryland, yeah. uh, Lisa Cook of Michigan, mm -hmm. and Phil Jefferson of North Carolina. And which is interesting because both Maryland and North Carolina are a part of the Richmond, Richmond, yeah. Richmond Fed. And so, so they, the White House is 
basically ignoring this uh, this part the, of of the thing, which has happened before. Uh, I, I think this will be the the tenth and eleventh person uh, who the White House introduced, but they're not the only ones that matter, right? These nominations for governor are made. Uh, they're made by the White House and then confirmed by the Senate. So ultimately, the Senate can decide uh, whether it's okay they or not. Wanna, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they, sometimes they, they fight it, and sometimes they don't. Um, uh, and uh, and so, but I, I will say that having gone back through the history, this this thing that I'm going to publish hopefully in the next couple of days will show the last 50 years of of governors how they have defined where they're from. Because the 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 board of governors publishes which district they uh, they represent, and basically you can narrow it down to a couple of categories. Sometimes they use where they were born, even if they moved a couple months later. Uh, that's like Bernanke um, <laughs> childhood, where they yeah. spent time in their in their childhood years, where they went to college. Uh, I think the most common is where they worked previously. Like they had a job at some point in this area. Um, that one's the most. And then the one that you people think that it is, or what you would guess is your current job. Um, but that one is only like able to be used, uh, something like 35 or 40% of the time because they're often from other areas. So, so it's an See, interesting, I didn't know this one. This is, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. So this is a fun one, you know, the, the big, so, so, um, Oh man, the senator's name is escaping me. Um, but it, Peter Diamond was nominated in by Obama, I think in ten or eleven, oh, and gosh. the Senate banking chair, whose name I can't remember right now, um, put up didn't want Diamond. Period. Yeah, that was... And the, you know, he <laughs> between it was crazy. Like between the time he was nominated and the, the confirmation hearings and stuff, he, he won the Nobel Prize. And like, you know, just very obviously very qualified. Uh, but the senator, the like cudgel by which he beat down this nomination was this geography rule saying that there was already a, a governor from this area. Uh, so so we'll see it. And then, you know, and then to be honest, Democrats had many reasons to oppose Judy Shelton. And actually not just Democrats, reasonable people had many reasons to oppose Judy Shelton. Uh, but one of which was she was claiming to be from California uh, when she won. So it's been used by both sides. Um, <laughs> they fudged it. It's basically up to the Senate to decide how much they, they care. Although to be completely honest, having had the diamond experience in living memory, everything for Biden is in living memory. Like he was a part of that. He, I mean, at least tangentially, I would have thought for sure they would have at least put on the nomination list a different state yeah, from, like from where they were. Just to, just knowing that that criticism is like, it's so easy, low hanging fruit to yeah, criticize. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter ultimately. And, and the country has changed a lot. Uh, somebody told me, that basically you can, as long as you've flown over a district, you can claim that it's, that you're from there. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't so, try oh. that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that senator might not be excited about it. Um, yep. Okay. So, so that's, that's the geography side. So yeah, that's, the, that's there and there and there. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting, but it, it's definitely not the most important. So let me go back. I got a couple more things on uh, some, just from, from history that are interesting on the, uh, on race and gender. So, so as you mentioned, Jefferson will be the fourth, uh, the fourth black man, uh, first one was Andrew Brimmer um, back in the in the 60s, and I think his will be cool. Somebody was talking on on Twitter about some of the work that that Brimmer did, and and Brimmer did a good job of, or it, not even subjective. I don't want to be subjective about this, but he did an interesting job of taking on, not being afraid to take on some some projects at the Fed that were directly related to diversity. Um, but he also took on a bunch of projects that were clearly not. And I'm excited to see the degree to which Cook and Jefferson decide to take that on. And it's all based on personal, you know, personality, uh, the degree that they they want to approach it head on. This is the first time that there will ever be two Black people on the governors at the same time. Uh, there again, a shocker, but uh, but an important one that will that will do it. I, I don't think that can be overemphasized enough. You know, as you've said, the Fed's public persona is they're so much more open than they were before. And they end up getting, the, the public has a lot more access to the Fed than they ever have before. And there's just study after study that shows that 
that, that people are more open to, to talking when they're doing it with people that, that look like them. Like that's just part of, part of human nature. And so the fact that, for example, just to give one concrete example, in starting pretty soon, possibly as soon as next year, in 2023, the Fed's going to begin their framework review. They're now going to do it every five years. And so they're going to start doing these big public events, and they're going to try and get in as much input from all areas of the economy, all levels of the income spectrum and education spectrum. And having two Black governors as part of that group going out to solicit feedback and to, to get opinions, I think, can't be overstated how important that is. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, as we celebrate the progress, I, yeah. um, I think it's important to note we have a long way to go. Um, Senator Menendez, I think it was Menendez, yes. at the yep. Yep. hearing, um, both for Jay yes. and Lael, brought yes. up the point that there has never been a Hispanic member of the mm -hmm. Board of Governors. And I think he said never a reserve bank president, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, yep. so, I mean, think about that. We have mm -hmm. a large Hispanic Latino population in the United States, a growing one, yep. Euro representation. Yep, um, yep. yep, oh yeah, yeah. no, no, no. This, and and, and that's friend. not the only group, I mean, Native American. Yep. Surely there's been Asian at some point, but I'm like really, blind. I don't think I worked mm. for any. No. Yeah, not, so not, like, not in the FOMC, not at the FOMC. Yeah, so like this, because I do, I firmly believe that good policies are made when you, like there are a lot of people, like the vast majority of people who are affected by policy are not sitting in the room. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they can be, there's a lot of ways to represent the voices. I mean, first of all, you have to go out and listen and interact yeah. with people. And that often can be difficult. I think the reserve banks have a model that at least allows them proximity to people in a way that like sure. Washington DC is not like the, you know, the rest of the country, right? So you sure. really got to get out and, and put an effort in, but there is a real, I hate the word authenticity, um, but like there is something about that lived experience and there's just no way, like I cannot know in the way that Lisa Cook does, like at all, what it means to be a black woman. Like yep. we both have experience as women economists, but like totally. that's something totally, not totally different, but I mean, that really does shape her views. Absolutely, of on, course. And not just her views about right like it just brings in like people of color and backgrounds and so this is good Absolutely. the fed has a long way to go Absolutely. unfortunately um backlash is real and the fed yes. what they're doing in terms of diversity and inclusion sits within a much bigger conversation in the united states and frankly there's a lot of i mean many central banks the, the oh, yeah. Bank of England, the ECB, the European Central Bank have all had big diversity uh, initiatives, conferences on it that the Fed has participated in. It is not lost on anyone that there are many groups that are not at the table. Um, yeah. But of course, with progress comes backlash. And yeah. I expect, I think it's particularly going to come up at Lisa's hearing, yeah. uh, maybe sure. at Phillips as well. But I do think Lisa she's a black woman, she's going to get it yeah. from both sides, um, yeah. the, the Fed is a woke Fed, right? right. And we've had, right. this has come from a lot of corners. I mean, uh, you know, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers had an op-ed where he said that. And yeah. to me, like, it's, it's offensive on so many levels. But the main thing is, like, the Fed like the like there are so many adjectives and I love the Fed, <laughs> but like woke is not one of them. <laughs> right. Like and that's yep. not <sighs> anyway, so but there there is yeah. progress being made. I do agree with you that it's about representation. Um, but it doesn't stop with who's sitting at the table. The when they did the first framework review, um, there was a very new initiative, this Fed listens where they mm -hmm. set up, as the name suggests, uh, listening sessions across the country. Right. And there was one conference in Chicago where they had a blended approach. So there were academics, so policy experts who talked about the ways to improve, like this would, 
there were ideas like open discussion of ideas about okay how do we change what we're doing or do we change it you know like in terms of interest rate targeting and like all the wonky stuff so there were like wonky panels and then there were panels with people um <laughs> you know a university pres like a community college chancellor yeah. um Juan Salgado who I hosted at a conference like he's amazing oh, cool. Um, cool. He, should, he should be on the board um <laughs> so he has a, a busy job but they also had people from uh, worker groups and, and businesses. I mean, sure. that's an important um, group as well. And those were really interesting panels. Lael moderated the one that once Elgato was on. And again and again, when the Fed talked to people, now mind you, inflation was really low at that point. Uh, but when they talked to people, particularly ones that came out of marginalized communities, they said it's jobs. Yeah. We need jobs. Yeah. We need good jobs. Yeah. And I do think I, I am a big fan of the new framework because I see it as elevating maximum employment to be on par yeah. with stable prices. I don't think they've emphasized it above. And COVID, I mean, we could, we're not going to today, but we could talk a lot about what's happened yeah, we could. Sure. Um, during the COVID crisis. From the center to the side. Um, but I think it was extremely fortuitous that they had the new framework when they when they did, because this would be a lot harder for them to justify the policy stance. Um, but the piece of history with the Fed that ties into this that I have it was years ago, but like this has just really fascinated me. Like, where did this maximum employment mandate come from? And it goes. I mean, the United States for like since the 1930s, the federal government has a full, like a commitment to full employment policies. Yeah. And it hasn't really delivered on that, but like there's, there's like a long history of full employment, which is a very fuzzy concept, but it's something close to everyone who wants to work has a job. Yeah. Like there, there are other qualifications people put on it, some more restrictive, some more expansive, but it's like this you can, if you want to work, you can work. Um, yeah. Where this started to come to the Fed, and you, you can correct or add oh, on to this, um, was in the civil rights movement. You know, the, the March on Washington was a march for freedom and jobs. Yep. And, and that was very like core, I mean, part of, I mean, freedom has, it's very intrinsic, like human dignity part of the country, the voting, sure. but it also, there's an aspect of security financially, right? And a job for like many, many Americans, like that's that's where the security comes from. And so um, Martin Luther King Jr. was very big on full employment and Coretta Scott King, yep. you know, was at the signing of the Humphrey Hawkins Act in 1978, which is the act, so the dual mandate, came in yep. 1977 that's when they added man the maximum employment yep. very few if any central banks have a dual mandate like it's all about yep. price stability somebody asked me about the bank of england why are they inflation of like like why are they raising rates and i'm like they don't have a dual mandate <laughs> like yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. inflation inflation is high um anyways so in 77 they got the dual mandate in 78 this humphrey hawkins act was what said the Fed chair has to come twice a year before the House and the Senate and basically sit in the hot seat yeah. and answer questions. And they also write a report. And it's kind of like this regular check-in to see if you are making progress. On this. So I just think that's fascinating. Um, Powell was asked yeah. about this last year, two years ago. And um, I think it was Representative Presley that asked him and kind of mm -hmm. talked about the history. And when she got yeah. to the end, he was like, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm sure the way Jay is, he spent the weekend reading up on the history, right? Sure. It's not something I learned sitting in the boardroom or any meeting at the Fed, yep. but it's fascinating. So anyways, but, and to me that is so connected with seeing black governors. Yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah, really no, I... where that came from. So I don't know. Like, add on to that like what else yeah yeah yeah, would yeah. so i would that? yeah so i would start by uh by just uh, adding a footnote to or to to a pin into to people's mind to go check out um 
to make sure to check out David Stein at, uh, he's currently at UCLA. He's a historian and his, his work uh, on, uh, on, on the civil rights movement and its relations to, uh, to, to employment and to the Fed, uh, he is phenomenal. He's got a book coming out. I don't know if it's coming out this year or next year, um, but about about all of this exact stuff about this 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 the inter uh, the interplay between um, between employment and the civil rights movement, which is awesome. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You know, the in addition that that Federal Reserve Reform Act in in '77 that kind of set that dual mandate. Uh, in addition to doing that, it uh, you know it, it for the first time. Uh, you know, added uh, anti-discrimination language to the part of the law that is re in regards to the boards of directors of the reserve banks, which was a really big deal. Like that wasn't in there before. So, you know, race, gender, national origin, all that stuff wasn't included until 1977. It also added language uh, expanding the, the the like the range of of sectors of the economy that should be that the Fed should be listening to because okay. they like again it's specifically talking about the board of directors of the reserve banks at this point um, but I think the message is spread across and added services labor and consumers okay. explicitly in the language and that's just one area one other thing that I'll talk that I I was slightly disappointed. Uh, in this full suite of, of nominees, not within any of the individual nominees. I'm excited about all of them and think the direction is great. Though I will note that we still have not had a single uh, member of the FOMC, so either a Reserve Bank president or a governor who has come from a background in organized labor. Um, you know, I think we there was, there, so was there we were close. Yeah, this time I, I, I thought maybe <laughs> We, we, we would get it, and I, I don't know the reporting uh, on on that one, um, but yeah, but we're we're still we're still out uh, uh, that area. So just another pin to add into the we're, we've made a lot of progress, and it's really cool progress, um, but we have a long way to go. Now at the at the FOMC level, you know, I, it's been a long time since we've had someone without a college degree, and I'm not advocating that someone with a college without a college degree should be on there or not. Uh, but I will say there are some cool people. There are a few cool people throughout the Federal Reserve System that are directors of these reserve banks. And it's basically, it's a, a relatively small job. You know, this isn't their full-time job. Uh, you could almost think of it like being uh, any corporate person or, 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 or leadership within education or healthcare being on a board of a nonprofit. Those are kind of like the jobs. Yeah, they're an oversight. And, yeah, they and, have some oversight. And you have yeah. done a ton of work on this. Yes, and, I have and done. And have written, yep. you have a piece, an opinion yep. piece with Fanta Traore. Yep. And where was, where was that at? That was at Fortune. At Fortune, that was, that's right. Yeah, that was at Fortune. Yep. So, yep. Fanta, but um, they're again, awesome plug. She's <laughs> co-founded the uh, Sadie Collective, yep. which is just doing super, super cool uh, cool work. Uh, so yes, we've gotten to do some work with her. Um, and you know, um, so anyways, these directors are an important part. They provide some really cool stuff. Um, Peter Conti Brown, Brian Feinstein, and I just published last week, uh, a paper that ties, that finds some really strong correlation between how well commercial banks do at lending to poor communities, uh, and how that correlates pretty strongly with the level of diversity at the reserve banks, boards of directors. Um, no, we could the we could spend a lot of time on board of yeah. directors. I should have you back to after your no, that's so, okay. Um, that's okay. But no, I think and and that came up at the hearings too. Yeah, like there because the the board of governors there's a lot of boards to keep track of. Here. Yes, there are. Um, yes, the there board are. of governors has they have to approve the director slates, right? Or is it just for the one class of directors? Yeah, so they they formally appoint the three of the nine directors. Uh, they have the authority to remove okay. the other six, but they but they don't have to approve. They don't have to uh, approve, but they approve. can block. Yeah. So I think this is one where in the push to diversify the federal yes. reserve system, there yes. has been the board has never exercised this like to, to really intervene forcefully. I mean, I'm sure there's always, 
there are conversations that happen before yeah. like people are yeah. put in positions. Um, but that is a lever that members of Congress have noted and asked about. And um, I think Leo was a point on reserve banks. I think yes, she was. was. Yeah. So anyways, well, we can go deep into the weeds here. But I think yeah. the the work with the, the directors, um, and actually it was really funny, yesterday the news was announced that the Chicago Fed, that Lisa Cook was going to be a, on the board of directors at the Chicago Fed. And I had people messaging me and they're like, she did it. Does that mean she can't get the gun? Oh, is it, is oh, okay. a booby prize? Like, and I was like, these are so separate. Yeah. I don't think she can do both jobs. <laughs> I saw yeah. those two announced today, and I was like, someone was, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> this is, yeah. a, um, they will find someone else. Um, yeah. Yep. She was. And that underscores when you have one capable person, they start showing up in multiple positions. They do. Um, but, you know, kudos to Chicago Fed that she would have served there very well, but she will get a lot more. She'll get to contribute oh. a lot more. Yeah. Say, yeah. There's um, no. On yeah, the board no, of governors. Yeah, no <laughs> so. comparison in impact. Um, no comparison impact. Although interesting also to add to your trivia board, she will be the ninth person to have been a director that then becomes a, a governor. <laughs> For this short uh, period of time. Yeah, no, but I think probably it's probably the shortest. Uh, yeah. She was elected, interestingly enough. So she was elected, and this would have happened months ago. This would have happened last fall. She was elected to the Chicago Fed Board of Directors by the big banks in the Midwest, oh, basically. Yeah. She, that's how she landed in that spot. Yeah. So it's a cool, uh, a cool, a cool spot. Yeah, so no, it's, so I think this underscores the point that there are a lot of, there's a lot of people with some kind of position of authority, whether it's decision-making and policy, or it's some kind of oversight over the policymakers, like choosing reserve bank president or giving feedback like they they have a connection to the the federal reserve officials that just like you and i don't right like yes correct. Uh, correct correct and so yep that would be great um yeah, no, but yeah, i mean yeah. it's you know so it, they're important rules and on all of those dimensions the fed has been way beyond behind the curve in representing the American people, like on so many dimensions, right? The yeah. Fed became a very, actually the Fed started, but I mean, it, it is, it has been historically a white man run institution. Now it was a well-run, largely yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. institution, yeah, yeah. but like it's, that is not representative, right? So yeah. there, there are just so many dimensions that one can push to, Get more representation and we're seeing that and you are definitely um, definitely pushing this conversation with the directors at the reserve banks because that's a little more obscure very much so like, very much um, so. but important right it's like it's just like we said these conversations about diverse diversity go way beyond the fed and so it yeah. makes sense that it's showing up all throughout and the federal reserve staff has yes yeah, yeah. Um, in the system um as a shout out kristen brody who is a black woman professor she was actually a dean of a business school at dillard before she came to washington dc and she'd been at brooking you know kind of yeah. introduction to policy and she is starting a new position as the director of economic mobility at the chicago fed wow look at that okay um, Sweet. and she'd already recently there was a sh there was like a federal reserve kind of scorecard on like black and br like women yes. and different at all the reserve banks and she yes. actually had a reporter already call her and be like they get to update the table for <laughs> the chicago That's amazing. she's like oh my gosh and i think it like wow. goes from two to three or something i mean like you know anyway so it's a big yes. deal um yeah. but she'll be great in that position and and the fed has created new kinds of roles and positions to give these new voice like really bring in expertise and then yeah. At the end of the day, it's about better policy. Absolutely. Right? So that's the path towards it. In any case, yeah. So the Fed's doing a lot. It's getting pushback from the little bit it's doing, but I do think there's a lot of momentum. This isn't a new project. Like in the time I was at the Fed, there was a definite shift. I think it started with Bernanke. Bernanke was a very busy man, right? So like we didn't, I don't, but there was an, an absolute change from Greenspan to him 
I never yeah. worked for Greenspan, but you can tell Greenspan's aura was in the building when I started yes, and it dissipated mm -hmm. over time. Um, though he'd still come in and get his hair cut. So you'd see him every once in a while. Amazing. Yeah, and he had no hair. Um, anyways, uh, so, but like then, especially when Yellen took over, like this became a priority, a priority of the chair. As yeah. it turns out, when the chair wants to do something, everybody falls in line. Stuff happens. There were yeah. officers serving on diversity and inclusion committees that frankly had been a problem with it. But like I said, hey, you might actually learn something if you have to sit in a meeting and yeah. like tell Janet Yellen that you're all in on it. Like, yeah, you know, fake totally. until you make it, right? Like, so, um, and one of the things when, when Janet was finished as chair, there was a big discussion. And I think among staff, it wasn't clear how this would land because it had been a program that had been set by the chair. Hmm. All these committees that were created yeah. under it, because that's how the Fed does anything. Yes. Um, yes. But then there was a question, will Jay take it on? And Jay was like, of course. <laughs> right? Like, he yeah. was just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. why would this? Because he's one that, he came from the corporate sector. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, yeah. And he's like, corporate, they get it. Yeah, right? like you, totally. you, and I think the business has been in many cases ahead of the curve. I mean, they have the financial sector had a yeah, lot yeah. of ground to make up too. Sure, nowhere near the finish line, but he was just like, of course, of course. and we're all like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, and and they've continued to do more. Once the ball gets rolling, the Fed moves very, very slowly. But once it starts moving, it, it does doesn't move. Stop. Right? Yeah, like it's kind of a yep. neat thing about um, the iceberg. Um, Although that's probably a, not a <laughs> way. I don't know. Like the ball rolling. Let's stay with that. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think we, so this has been a super conversation. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, what didn't I ask you about? What, what's some last like fed thought yeah. even in the context of these nominations? Yeah. In the context of these, head. yeah, yeah. In the context of these nominations, uh, you know, the thing that is is on my mind uh, and and they're they're related are kind of two things one is the is the we're going to have four at least search committees if not announcements of four new reserve bank presidents this year we've got boston and dallas i i expect i keep waking up every morning expecting boston because they got a potential vote that they're leaving on the table yeah, i really think not. we'll have that one before the january i exactly I'm yeah saying. yeah i would I agree. I would suspect that. And then Dallas won't, shouldn't be too long. And then we'll have Chicago and, and, and uh, um, Kansas City. Evans and George are out in January of 2023 because of another weird Fed governance thing, which is they're aging out. Yeah. There's a limit. They have to leave at 65. There's a mandatory age limit, which... I saw this when I started the Fed. I'm like, how is this possible? Is this age discrimination? And then it was, that was when I learned that the reserve mm -hmm. banks are quasi-private. Correct. They're not mm -hmm. federal agencies. They're funded by their banks, which we won't even get into that. Like, <laughs> this is the, as like, how did we think that was going to not be a conflict of interest? Yeah. But it means they're private and private sector can have age limit. I understand it sometimes is a little squishy, but. Like, yeah. So this was one of the, this was one of the ungodly long threads that I did about this and they have. So yeah, there, there's a law and there are two exceptions for age discrimination. And one of those exceptions is in the private sector, if you're an executive, uh, you, you they can still discriminate based on your age. And so that's, it's interesting. It used to be, there's tons of history there. We won't go into that. So, but I, but those, those four positions, I'm gonna be looking very closely at those. And then related to this is, and, and why it's such a big deal that Biden has now picked five of the seven governors is, the, the ethics scandal of the last six months, like this is a really good time for there to be a kind of a, a cleaning out, a sweep of, 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 of the old and in with the new. And, and uh, this, this uh, you know, we're still waiting to hear from the inspector general report about more specifics uh, about that scandal, but, but it's a really good thing to have this new fresh face of uh, of people, um, you know the changes that they the ethics changes that they made. I think are fantastic, and we won't go into detail about about that scandal. But but it is related, I think, to this to these both the nominees from yesterday, uh, the Biden's picks for chair and vice chair in November, uh, and the upcoming four Reserve Bank president appointments that are going to happen 
is that's going to be you know a part of it that you know this is we, we really need strong ethical leaders i'm super happy with uh, the nominees they definitely fit that that category uh so far so uh looking forward to seeing uh how a lot of these questions that we'll be looking for play out yeah no i i totally agree i've talked a lot about this year that there is a sea change happening in economic policy i am certain it's happening in monetary policy and like i said when the fed starts moving it is moving yeah. right we're, yeah. we're not this year is going to be a big year to figure out how new the new fed is I agree. And if they can I agree. do this i have full faith in them i might not always agree with their policy decisions but I, there are these are people who are highly skilled and are extremely committed to doing the right thing the policy but to your point we have had three Fed officials resign for trading during the financial crisis of 2020. That is, you know, these are allegations. They all did resign. That kind of cuts again across the green of what I just said about consummate public servants, but you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but there's a chance for this restart. Change is hard, change is really hard in a little C conservative institution, right? Yeah. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of precedent and it's it's tough to change right especially yeah. for those already on the inside like that, kind yeah. of, that kind of criticism is really hard to work through new people personnel is policy i mean yeah. policy matters yeah. most but it really it really really matters who's sitting at the table it does um and so that's that's good i i didn't realize we had two more after uh, Boston and Dallas that we the crazy thing is they 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 were born exactly the same day it's like I, I don't remember what day in January but they they have the exact same birthday Esther George and uh Charlie Evans they and so they yep January 2023 so they don't I <laughs> to start this summer sometime yeah okay well there's so much to look forward to I really appreciate you taking time today a little walk down history lane and uh we're looking forward to a lot more from you and great all right well thank you so much caleb and do take care thanks thanks, thanks claudia